good evening, good afternoon, or good morning to you, wherever you are in the world right now. Willkommen, dobro pojalovat, svaga, bienvenido, bienvenu, benvindo, alan bika, and welcome to our incredibly diverse multilingual community, joining us from more than 80 countries across the globe in eight different languages. My name is Ethan Earl, and this is What Winning Looks Like, a new show hosted by Jane McAlevey and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in which we dare to stare victory in the face together. Tonight's first episode takes us to Germany, where we will meet some courageous hospital workers who, together with their union Verity, have just won a standard setting collective agreement through a combination of rigorous preparation, cross sector and cross class unity, and the power of a well executed strike. And they did this smack dab in the middle of a pandemic, turning on its head the crushing pandemic logic that they should just shut up and get on with their jobs. And instead, fighting for and winning an agreement that will keep them and their patients safer. Their powerful strike grabbed headlines across Germany and the world. And we will get to that strike during today's program. But to get there to that point to be strike ready, these hospital workers had to do the hard and oftentimes unheralded work that undergirds every big organizing victory. Identifying organic leaders, changing the way that they talk about their shared struggles and their union, framing the hard choice in organizing conversations with skeptical colleagues, charting power structures and both gauging and showing off their power with well-timed structure tests. If this sounds familiar to you, well, you might already know Jane McAlevey's pioneering work, and you might already have been introduced to these core organizing fundamentals during the Organizing for Power training program. Over the past two years, Organizing for Power has welcomed nearly 25,000 organizers from 110 countries. The vast majority of our graduates have participated as organizing groups, and many of them, including some of these very hospital workers, have used Organizing for Power to sharpen and advance their campaigns and their organizing struggles. We'll be hosting our next six week training on the core fundamentals of organizing starting this May 10th. And we welcome all of you to join. And in fact, we know that some of you have already gotten the news and are planning to take part. Here, I have to give a special mention to Morocco's Confederation Democratique du Travail, who have already organized nearly 600 members for our core fundamentals training, many of whom are here today to begin their preparation for that training. Bonjour and assalamu alaikum to our Moroccan comrades. Mm -hmm. For them and for all of you who want more details about this upcoming program, stick around until the end of today's session. In the meantime, in just a moment, we are going to celebrate a victory, which is something that we who fight for justice do not do nearly often enough. And we are going to reflect on how that victory came to pass, to look under the hood, to understand what made this campaign run. We're gonna talk about core principles like openness and democracy and campaign drives, both on the streets and at the bargaining table. We're going to talk about the need to think offensively more than ever following decades of austerity and attacks on workers' rights, about the need to move beyond defensive positioning to attack the actual structures that contain constrained victory. And yes, I am talking about state actors. And yes, I do mean bosses. There's little that strikes more fear into the hearts of those who defend existing structures of inequality and injustice than large scale industrial action collective action that brings people together across workplaces and across cities to credibly threaten and if necessary, launch an offensive minded strike that is actually prepared to win. This is what winning looks like. And now without further ado, let me introduce our host, the labor strategist, the organizer, the educator, the person that I choose first every single time when it comes to picking sides for a battle that needs to be won. Jane McAlevey. What a fabulous welcome. Thank you so much, Ethan. And I am so delighted to be here uh, with all of you today. And I am particularly excited about getting to the discussion and hearing directly from the workers. I want to just acknowledge that, you know, the disparities in how this pandemic is being addressed or handled are grotesquely unequal, 
Um, and the fact that we're having a feature discussion today about hospital workers in a pandemic who chose to do what few have done so far, which is just say, not anymore. We cannot sustain these conditions anymore. Uh, is the kind of bold action that we're going to need to tame a really rapacious, completely out of control corporate and capitalist class that is running all over the world with many of the same ownership structures. Part of what's so great about Rosa Luxemburg and Organizing for Power and why this program is so special is that we know the fight is going to have to happen country by country, but also with all of us linked together. Uh, so what I want to do is spend just about 10 minutes trying to get everyone on the same page on the numbers, some of the basics about the incredible Berlin hospital workers campaign um, so that everyone can just get into the discussion when we hear from the workers themselves. But a couple of quick opening comments. One, the legal structures in Germany are very different than the legal structures in the United States. And the legal structures in the United States and Germany are probably very different than Argentina or Morocco or Ghana or many of the places that we have been doing work in through the Organizing for Power program. The political structures are different, labor law is different in different countries. And what we're learning, what we believed coming into the program and what we now believe to be true is that despite that, what wins for ordinary people, for all of us. What wins against the employer class is when we can build really high participation and really deep unity and solidarity. The two things that we need are really high participation in a structured way, right, to be strike ready, to build the kind of machine we need to sustain a strike, and that requires a lot of solidarity. And what we believe and we've learned is that the methods, that there are methods that help us understand how to do that. When you're a hospital worker, there's a ton of methods that you learn, right? There's a better way to take care of a certain procedure with a patient, and there's probably very less good ways to take care of the same patient. It's not different with organizing. There actually are methods. Some work better than others, and I want to be very clear, I did not invent any of these. I learned them from my mentors in the trade union movement as a young organizer, and I have owned them ever since because in every strike, every contract campaign, every organizing victory, these are the methods that I've relied on. And fascinating to me is that though the laws are really different, I'll give you one example. In the United States, in a hospital strike, the first thing the employers do is replace all the workers. So part of our strategy is if you can get 90 to 100% of the workers to walk off the job, the employer is going to replace all of them with what we call strike breakers or scabs. And some of the leverage becomes, if we do it right, the employer has to pay a double payroll, like literally twice the number of workers at once. Very technical, very complex. But in Germany, where the same methods were just used in a very massive successful campaign, you can't replace striking workers under German labor law. Like you actually can't do it. So how you do a hospital strike under a scenario where you actually can't all walk off the job is some of what we're gonna learn about today from the workers themselves who did it. And again, the key is the methods were the same in two, to, two very different settings. So as someone who has spent my life trying to be obsessed about how do we win, how do ordinary people rebuild the kind of power that's gonna balance the fact that some parts of the world have very little vaccines right now and the country I'm sitting in, it's disgusting how much access there is to the vaccine compared to other parts of the world. For example, how we're going to balance that kind of inequality is going to take campaigns just like the one that we're going to talk about from Germany. So I want to very quickly run through a couple of slides just to get everyone on the same page about the basics in this campaign. And here we go. Always the technical, that's my favorite part. So basically what people need to know before I introduce the speakers from Germany uh, is that there were two hospital systems and roughly 33,000 workers involved in the Berlin hospital workers movement. 
One hospital is called Vivantes. It's the largest public hospital company in all of Germany. Third largest employer in all of Berlin with 17,900 employees. And they have eight hospitals that were all involved in the struggle and the strike across the city. The second major hospital is called Charité. It's the largest university hospital of Germany. It's a fully public institution, a little bit different with Vivantes. It's still public, but the management system was essentially privatized uh, and the move towards full privatization was stopped, which is a good thing. But they have different, slightly different legal structures, though they're both public. So Charité is the largest university hospital, fully like a unit of the state. It's the second largest employer in Berlin. So we're talking about the second and third largest employers in the entire city state called Berlin. Uh, and they have three hospitals in Berlin. So this was an 11 hospital, 30,000 plus worker campaign uh, where they won. The timeline briefly went like this. <clears throat> The campaign, which Donna, one of the top leaders, is going to explain a little bit more, so I don't want to get ahead of her. But basically, what we're going to be talking about today is the beginning of the launch was really in January. Planning began over a year ago. She'll talk more about that. But there were several key structure tests and several key moves on the way to the strike. And that's just what I want to show you with some of the images from the strike itself. There was an ultimatum given to the political uh, elite. Um, as you can see in the slides, there was the strategy of the campaign had a lot to do with the September 26 federal elections, both in Berlin and nationally. So September 26, 2021, the workers understood there was going to be huge elections. And what that meant was they were going to be driving a strike deadline towards, towards creating a crisis for the political elite during their election. So in April, they launched officially inside the hospitals with their first structure test, which is the majority petition, which you see up in the box on the left-hand side on your screen. There were over 8,397 out of roughly 13,000 on the professional side. So there were different structure tests done because the campaign involved nurses and certified workers, as well as non-certified and all the rest of the workers that actually make the hospital run. So the first structure test was on one part of the campaign focused on nursing standards and then as the structure test continued the second structure test was a survey about the demands like there were conversations with tens of thousands of workers about what did they want to win in their contract. I should note quickly there were some legal injunctions against the strike several of them uh, I had the pleasure of being in Berlin this summer for the stadium and a, and a big meeting of the July 6th and 7th Conference of Team Delegates in the brief moment when we thought the pandemic was easing. Um, and I remember sitting at a table when the phone call came that a legal injunction against the strike had just begun. So there were a series of battles around the legal injunctions. The workers won them, but they didn't just win them with lawyers, to be perfectly clear. That's why I want to mention this. They won them through political pressure uh, that they put on the political elite. Then there were just a series of structure tests, what they call warning strikes, until they actually got to the strike itself with what you can see was a 98% uh, pro-strike uh, decision. So again, briefly, there were three different contracts, one for the professional nurses and certified workers at Charité, one for the professional and certified workers at Vivantes, and then there was the contracted out workers at Vivantes, right? Vivantes actually began to subcontract out workers as part of the neoliberal reforms. And part of what makes this campaign so amazing is that all of these workers came together. Service workers, contracted out workers, nurses and professional workers. That, to me, is where we have to go in every country in this world. We have to build that kind of solidarity. So there was a collective agreement for the nurse side focused on winning limits on how many patients each nurse could handle at a time. And for the service workers, it was a fight to bring their standards of wages and working conditions up to the sort of national public sector contract in Germany. And that part of it involved cleaners, kitchen workers, service employees, medical assistants, you can see listed there, 2,500 workers in about 100 units were in the contracted out units. And there was a conscious decision by the brilliant leadership in this campaign to make this one big fight. All hospital workers all across the city fighting and struggling together. 
It was a long and strong strike. At Charité, it was 32 days till they were able to win. Vivantes, 35 days. These were open-ended strikes. And at what they call the daughters, uh, Vivantes, daughters is what we would call subcontracted or subsidiaries, they had to hold out for 42 days of strike. Another big difference in Germany, to at least my own country and many others, but not unusual in other parts of the world, they can actually strike units. I know that's true in the United Kingdom, it's true in a lot of Europe. They can strike one unit in a hospital. Uh, we wish we could do that here, but we can't. Um, so a, a number of key units were closed. There was a power analysis done. Those units were the ones that would cost the employer the most money if they were closed. So you do a little math on how to do power structure analysis in the campaign. Um, and there were thousands and thousands of, of workers on demonstrations routinely through Berlin over the course of a couple of months. Part of what was different was that there were 750 delegates elected by unit and by ward across the city and a 75 worker negotiation committee. I'm gonna let Donna in a minute talk about all this from her experience because it was pretty amazing to watch it happening and really high participation of all of these workers at every stage of the negotiations. There was a big stadium meeting in a football stadium, part of the power structure analysis that helps people understand, looking about all the ways to bring people in. Uh, and at this big meeting, um, media, uh, meeting in a football stadium, the workers pledged to support and endorse and stand united across all hospitals and all kinds of workers. And I was brought to tears, I will tell you several times, watching workers get up and talk about why they had to make change and why they had to make change now. And they understood they could only do it if they were all together. There were a series of things like big church hearings that took place, very unusual, and let the workers talk about them. I wanna to point to a couple of methods. This is a picture of German workers looking at their wall charts. You know, in Organizing for Power, we talk a lot about wall charts and about structure tests. And finally, before I begin to introduce Donna, a top leader in the campaign, uh, an example um, of a majority structure test, in this case, a majority photo petition, uh, and some of the workers uh, looking at the majority petition. So just to give you a, hopefully that gave you enough of a flavor of the campaign so that you could actually understand the very basics as I introduce the workers. So we're going to start off by hearing from uh, Donna, Lutzkendorf. Donna is an amazing nurse leader. I met her probably my first trip, I think. I'm sure I met her my first trip to Germany back in 2019. She has been an intensive care unit nurse for 21 years at Charité Hospital. She is a leader's leader, uh, which is why she eventually became the national chairperson of the National Verdi, of the Union Verdi, for the healthcare division. She is a leader in her own hospital. She was involved in leading a much smaller strike um, at Charité in 2015 before rolling into the idea that all the workers had to struggle together uh, in the big 20, 2021 campaign. So Donna uh, is an amazing leader and we should bring her on now. And we're gonna hear from Donna. This is when, as Ethan mentioned, if you're an English speaker, you need to go down and look at the globe on the bottom of your screen. It's a little globe. And if you are someone who does not speak German, you want to put that to English uh, because that um, is, that is uh, what you're going to need to do to listen to Donna's speech. So Donna Lutzkendorf, please join us. Hi, um, hello. Uh, thank you for your warm words. I'm so excited. So yeah, I start uh, with German. Um, Okay, also der beste okay, then the best moment of this campaign was one that I will surely never forget. The employer side refused to negotiate with us during the strike, but after 14 days into the strike, suddenly they changed their mind. So we met up for the negotiation round on campus in the Steglitz district of Berlin. The entire bargaining committee was present during these negotiations, but we also got management to agree that the many team delegates from the hospital's various units and departments could join us by holding a meeting in the room directly next to us, in a big room, allowing us to go back and forth easily and often. There was a moment during this stage of negotiations in which we had already won a number of concessions from management. 
At this point, while we were debating the staffing rules, the negotiations stalled because the employer was still rejecting the specific levels of staff nurses we believed were necessary, but they would not move any more towards the nurse-to-patient ratios we had said we would not settle without. But they said the agreement did contain nurse-to-patient ratios, days off. For the employer, the fact that they had gone that far was more than they had ever planned at the start of this campaign. And then they said it, that we should either accept it or negotiations would be over. They gave us an ultimatum of less than one hour to accept or reject their offer and they got up and they left the room. And yeah, although they're offering us something, it was certainly not a good offer either. It didn't feel right for us to simply accept the offer, but their threat seemed pretty serious. So we walked into the next room to meet and discuss with the team delegates. And we discussed the offer, looked at it from all angles and considered all possibilities. And then the delegates communicated with their co-workers in the wards and phoned their colleagues at home to get a vote from them on how to proceed. And eventually the message was clear. We would continue our strike, draw up our red lines overnight and we were going to walk back in and tell management we won't accept their offer and their ultimatum. And the whole auditorium was flush with this combative spirit and determination. The enthusiasm of all the team delegates being there and being defined and prepared to fight for what we need also engulfed the bargaining committee and our leading negotiators. So we proudly returned to the negotiation table and told management we reject the offer. And just a few hours later, the employer said they were willing to continue negotiating with us the next day. I am interested in you describing to the audience what made this campaign different. That's, that's the central question. I mean, you've got this history. You've led another strike before at Charité. You've been there for a couple of decades. You're an incredible leader. But there was a lot different, it seems, about this campaign. So tell us what was different. Yeah. I have been an active member of my trade union Verdi for more than 10 years now. There have been many campaigns in the past in which we certainly had high aims, but what I had never experienced before was how this time the workers, the union, drew up a plan and collectively implemented this plan. Just imagine, we worked out our plan in October, November 2020. And we launched the first stage in January 2021. And the aim was to bring the plan to a conclusion before the general elections in September. So almost three quarters of a year. It was the first time ever that we prepared such a detailed plan, a plan which then actually came to fruition. Of course, not everything worked and we had to make adjustments along the way, but the point of making plans is that you're ready and know how to adjust them as conditions change in reaction to the campaign itself. But by and large, our plan was good and it worked. It was so exciting and it's so encouraging too. We as workers, as healthcare workers, that is to say, as care work experts, are not only able to take responsibility for our patients, just like we are capable of making a treatment plan for a patient, we are also capable of putting together a plan to change our own lives for the better too. I'd like to point out four aspects that I think were really important and really, really different about the campaign. And as I outline these, they will sound familiar to anyone in the audience who has been taking the RLS Organizing for Power courses, because the ideas for the campaign we are discussing today come directly from the work we have been doing with the methods that Jane, through the Organizing for Power trainings, is now sharing with the world. Firstly, and that's something that Jane already mentioned, is in capitalism, we are divided up into different professional groups, which certainly applies in a hospital and constantly pitted against each other. Nurses against doctors, intensive care nurses against other nurses, assistant nurses against certified nurses, etc. And above all, however, there is a dividing line between the health professions in a stricter sense and the supporting service professions. As a result, our colleagues working in these services were paid much less for years. In order to save costs, their unit had been outsourced and run by subsidiaries of the hospital where collective bargaining contracts did not apply. There is no other reason for contracting out but to avoid more expensive unionized contract. 
Something we agreed on from the beginning was a hospital needs not only doctors, nurses and therapists. Without the cleaners, there are no operating rooms. Without the colleagues from the sterile supply department, there is no treatment of patients. Without the ambulance unit, there is no transport of patients. Without the canteen and kitchen staff, patients could not eat. So all these colleagues play a vital role in the care of sick people. That is why we said from the very outset, the treatment and care of sick people requires a hospital as a whole. A hospital means teamwork and that's why we built a single movement from two bargaining campaigns where we went on strike together and we worked collectively to increase the pressure on our employer. And all of this started with an oath taken by the team and the unit delegates during a large rally in the football stadium of a popular Berlin football club, the FC Union Berlin. What an impressive and inspiring event that was. In retrospect, there were, of course, various attempts by management to divide us. It was a really tough collective struggle, but in the end, both campaigns were successful and it shows how important it is to unite all hospital workers in one movement. Secondly, from the outset, we had a great faith in our strength and our readiness to strike. But throughout my professional life, I had been told that you can't pull off a strike in a hospital. It was a very widespread belief, including among trade union members. In particular, there was a fear of negative public reaction. But we proved an effective strike is by all means possible in a hospital too. There is no question that a hospital strike requires a great deal of preparation. No nurse or healthcare worker would ever leave their patients to themselves and go on strike. This is what I found so exciting, how we planned every detail of the strike and continuously built up our strength across the teams and different units. Only this way we were able to ultimately go on a 30-day strike. So let me just say this to all healthcare workers out there. The pandemic has demonstrated how important we and the work we do are for society. People were out there on their balconies applauding healthcare workers. But although this felt good, it doesn't change anything for us, of course. And there are many who feel there is no point in getting active and trying to change the way things are because nothing ever changes. But I think what it shows is that now is the perfect time to organize with co-workers and take things into our own hands. It is our collective power that can overcome the feeling of powerlessness. In our experience, the public is very sympathetic with striking health workers. However, to get the public with us, it requires meticulous preparation, building real relationships in the broader community and good public relations work. Der dritte Punkt and the third important aspect was the involvement of politicians in the campaign. Berlin is a city-state, one of 16 German states in total, meaning it has its own elected parliament, just like, say, Bavaria has. Whenever there are elections, there are election campaigns in the course of which political candidates like to be seen and gain media presence. Our plan was to take advantage of this. The Charité and Vivantes hospitals are public hospitals, which means that politicians, together with hospital management, have a special responsibility to ensure these hospitals provide good services to the city's population. Often enough, however, both sides refuse to take responsibility and they each claim it is the other's fault and they pass it back and forth between them. That's why we gave both of them a 100-day ultimatum to achieve a collective bargaining agreement before the elections. We used the elections as our deadline, so we knew we were working towards creating a crisis, towards a specific deadline. That was most likely the best idea of the whole campaign. We trained and coached a large team of colleagues, around 60 of them, particularly young and recently organized workers, in how to confidently talk to politicians and the press. Over time, they became very experienced and sophisticated at this. And some of them even were in direct contact with very important players. This came in very handy whenever negotiations stalled. How did we know who the very important players were? Prior to the launch of the campaign, we did something else we hadn't ever done before. Inspired by trainings we did with Jane, even before what has now become the Organizing for Power training program. We did a power structure analysis and analyzed whom we had to speak to if we wanted politicians to adopt our demands to their own agenda. After all, the issue at stake was the provision of health care for the people of Berlin. We proceeded very systematically. We organized events outside hospitals with local politicians, with the workers themselves acting as hosts and presenters. And we presented our case to caucuses and committees in the state parliament. Health workers tenaciously followed politicians around their campaigns, literally, so that in the end no one could ignore the hospital movement any longer. 
Some try to silence us, but we always manage to get our point across over and over again. But despite all efforts, initially the politicians exerted very little pressure on our employer. They were entertaining us, but not yet using their power. But then one event that prompted politicians to react took place in a famous church. It was full of striking hospital workers and they spoke to politicians at a meeting closed to the public. We had dozens of frontline nurses tell honest, heartfelt stories of how patient care was suffering in the hospitals due to low staffing. The politicians at this meeting finally had to listen to what cutting off costs in hospitals meant for our daily work. Meaning that in the early part of the century, the state began cutting back spending on hospitals and we've suffered years of cuts to staffing. And this has had a negative impact on healthcare workers and a very bad influence on patient care, even leading to fatalities. And we hinted strongly at what a scandal it would be should these stories we were testifying to in front of them become public. Many at that meeting were teary-eyed, including the politicians. After this event, pressure on our obstructive employers started mounting and there was increasing momentum from there on. And fourthly, one final aspect that I find very important. I have been a part of negotiating teams in the past. But prior to this movement, it was always a small circle that was supposed to negotiate on behalf of all the workers affected by the bargaining agreement. Although there would always be discussions and debris between the smaller negotiating committee and the larger contract commission before and after the negotiations, hardly any communication took place with the workers who are the true experts in their respective units and the bargaining committee. Our main demand were the staffing rules, but of course demands for pay and workplace health and safety were also very important. When we participated in an organizing for power workshop with a group of nurses for the first time in October, November 2019, we were so inspired by your presentation on open negotiations, Jane. This is a picture of a prospect man. I'm the one in the red shirt in the front. And so our objective in this campaign was to involve all the workers themselves in negotiations as far as possible. This certainly signified a new approach for our union, but eventually we won the argument to open up the process. One achievement was that the entire bargaining committee was present at the negotiating table. And also, radically different, we essentially made the team delegates an extension of our bargaining committee, whether it was to join the meetings and act as experts on their particular matters, or whether it was because we always had them in the room next door, so we could go back and forth and get immediate direct feedback from hundreds of frontline workers. This meant that the workers themselves were directly involved in the negotiations, which was just incredible. This added to our determination and built our confidence and also increased the trust between all of the workers and the team doing the negotiations. And all of us, we had so many wonderful, enlightening moments together. I just don't ever want to go back to what things were like before all of this happened. <clears throat> Listening to Donna is something that I could do pretty much all day, uh, every day, I think, for the rest of my life. So it was great to hear from you. I have one more uh, question. And just so the audience knows, I'm going to ask Donna one more question. Then we're going to bring on a panel um, of workers from the struggle itself as well. Uh, and then we're going to come back to Donna for a brief moment near the end of the uh, of the show. But before you leave, because we solicited some questions, we invited people to send in questions before the show even began. People are also using the question box to ask questions. But I want to ask you, because you are the a national leader in your union, not just a leader in your hospital, um, the most common question we've gotten so far was how did you persuade at your union who's used to doing negotiations very differently to actually open up the process and have a much, much larger committee and have close to 800 workers next to you so you could make group decisions all the time, right? Radical shift. How did that, how did that happen? That's, that's been the most common question that's come in so far. Yeah, so, um... Well, this is something that we as a negotiation team decided on together. We knew our union statutes and we knew that we were able to decide on how we want to negotiate. So together we took three decisions. 
Firstly, we said that we don't want to negotiate as a small committee, but as a big contract committee. But it was also very important to us to integrate the team delegates into the negotiation process. And thirdly, and this was very important, all of us agreed that we would never make a decision as a negotiating committee without discussing it among the delegates in the room next to us first. All of this sounds really, really simple, but of course it wasn't simple. The discussion wasn't easy. We discussed it among us, but also with the leading negotiators and we went back and forth. But in the end, everyone was convinced that the workers who would make and present their own demands, speak on behalf of their teams and who are the experts on their work. These workers should also participate in the negotiating process. We thought this is what would give us strength in the end. And as I told you before, it worked. And I just want to say this to everyone who is listening. Read your union statutes. Know your rights as members of negotiating committees. It works. It really works. Fantastic. That's great. Donna, we'll see you again in about 45 minutes or so. Really appreciate you sharing that amazing story of how you did this campaign. So now we're going to bring up three workers uh, who are representing some frontline stories, people who are on the inside, helping plan the campaign. Um, we have David, we have Adil, and we have Stella. And I'm sure I'm going to see them momentarily. Very excited to see them. And they are going to actually tell us a little bit about the work that they did in the campaign um, and how what the view was, right, when you're on the inside in the middle of these strikes and in the middle of these struggles. So I see Stella, that's totally terrific. And I'm looking for David and I'm looking for a deal. Sure, they're gonna come in a moment. I'm gonna start by asking all three of them to introduce themselves um, briefly uh, so we can get right to their stories. And I see Stella, so I think for time's sake, I'm just gonna start by asking Stella to tell us your full name, what kind of worker are you? And briefly tell us the most exciting moment, or for you, the most exciting moment in the campaign. And I'm going to ask that to Adil, and I'm going to ask that to David as well. All right, hello. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here. Um, my name is Della Merendino. I am an emergency room nurse, um, work in the emergency room since like five years, really enjoy it, besides the, uh, the actual work conditions. Um, the most amazing moment within the whole campaign was when we came back from the negotiation committee and won. So after those 30 hours with no sleep, just negotiations, and with this great outcome, I went straight back to our emergency room to tell my colleagues because I was really excited that we've won. And there was a really, really, really old colleague of mine. He's like nearly towards the end of his work career. Um, he only has two years or so left and he is a huge man. He's a huge man and he's really, really tough. And he came up to me, he hugged me and he actually started crying and was like, I never thought that nurses could stand up. I would have never thought that I could live to see something like that. And I was really touched. And um, that was the biggest moment from the campaign. And I'm really proud to have witnessed it. <laughs> right, help, help witness it uh, and help lead it, by the way. So that was fantastic, right? The image of, a, of a, <clears throat> someone who, the, we know that the healthcare industry and every set of bosses in the world tries to like drive cynicism and beat us down. So when a worker like that has the experience of like, oh my God, we actually did it. Uh, that are, those are the moments that we live for. Um, I agree, Stella. Do we have a deal and do we have David? Yeah, I'm right here, Jane. I... Hey, all right, where's the deal? <laughs> Hi, I'm, uh, like I'm David, um, I'm a nurse, I'm working at Charity. I'm working at the oncology hematology department for, um, six years and um, like I'm active in Verdi for the last um, five years. And the most striking moment 
uh, in this whole campaign was a meeting. We had, um, like before we went to the football stadium, we had a meeting um, with uh, colleagues from the oncology department, from the palliative care, and we had an intense discussion about what are the nurse to patient ratios that we are demanding. And we had such an intense and detailed uh, discussion, which was totally striking for me because I thought we could never like get all these people together. And this was the first um, moment in this whole campaign where I was convinced that we are going to win. Excellent, fantastic. And a deal, tell us your yeah. name, what you do, and the moment in the campaign that was the most exciting for you. So hi, Jenny, first of all, um, it's good to see you again. And uh, I would like to welcome every single person who is right now over here joining us and um, listening to us. Um, I introduce myself. My name is Mohammed Adi, and I'm working in uh, in a kitchen, um, Vivantes. And um, as far as our big moment, when we really knew that the uh, the turning point for us, when we got to know that we are allowed to go in a strike, which was not possible. It was getting very hard. We definitely waited for like hundred days. And after 100 days, they say we are not allowed to go in uh, strike. And then suddenly, how we somehow we all managed together to go in a strike. And it was a really, really big moment. It was the first start uh, where we really felt that we are going to achieve something um, all together. Yeah. So in my in my case, for my colleagues and everyone, I could say that it was the strike first strike which was being allowed which was very, very difficult to achieve in the moment after 100 days. Yeah. Incredible, incredible. And it, I want to stay with you for just a minute. Um, <clears throat> and I want to ask you how you, I've heard you say that winning the kind of raises uh, that you won in this campaign was not something that was possible for like the last 12 years. So from your view, why do you think you're able to win the kind of raises that you just won uh, in the pandemic? What about the campaign itself do you think helped lead to the kind of victory that you achieved? Um, in our case, I will sum up uh, with, um, in a very simple words, uh, how did we actually really achieve it? It was like, um, it was a unity, faith, and discipline. I mean, we went with these three things and um, First of all, we got in, we united ourselves and uh, we, we were very clear that we need this change, which was, which we were hearing from like many years in uh, working, uh, people who are working over there, uh, in their, in their views, it was not possible because it was just being going on and on and they were just uh, letting us go for next year, for next year, and people were not ready, really ready for all this change. And, um, then um, we, we started realizing that we need to unite ourselves for one, uh, for one concept and for one point. What do we really need a change or not? So we all got together and then uh, we created union. In our case, um, there was not a so strong union available before this strike. So we really had to make our union first. We used to, we, we came into one shelter and uh, with our same um, views that, yeah, it's time, we have to get together. And then, um, as I said, it was a faith uh, among us. Of course, you you had a lot of ch uh, challenges before when you start something so big. And um, we had a faith that if we stick all together, then we're going to reach at some place. And will we be good for us, ourselves, and of course, for the, uh, for the future. As uh, our, my other colleagues in our other departments were running after, they were having a problem of uh, less colleagues, less workers. We were really having a uh, problem of having low wages. And um, that was an inequality. It was the di biggest discrimination I find in a human that you pay for the same job, one less and one more. So uh, rather than doing the same job, these two people are doing the same job. So in our case, it was this. And then um, we had uh, this discipline we, we created in, among us that of course we were like emotionally disturbed 
uh, after 100 days when we got to knew that we are not allowed to go in a in a stride we were completely shocked we were totally shattered uh, it was like that we have been um, drowned we are no one i mean our words and our feelings and our our problems means nothing so in those period in that period of time i must say that of people who are going to uh, will be willing to change i mean i see so many great people they want to change please have faith in yourself and unite yourself and educate yourself more into the system of a un uh, union so that they get more further and further and achieve something better for themselves sorry if i have missed right. out something <laughs> that's great that's so great I mean, one thing that I one thing that I learned uh, pretty early on in my life, I've had the pleasure of bargaining, negotiating contracts for whole hospitals. Right, that's been a lot of my work in the United States. Sometimes it's just the nurses, but most of the campaigns have been the whole hospital. And what's very interesting, and I'm I think I'm going to turn to to Stella um, for this question. What's very interesting is one that there's a lot of division sown by management right, that there's, Donna mentioned this already, that sort of there's nurses and the professional workers and then there's other workers, uh, which we don't accept that kind of indignity, right, as workers. But in fact, in fact, it can be powerful sometimes as a weapon by management. And so what I have experienced in the United States is that both the nurses and the service workers both win more every single time we struggle together. Why? Because the power of the sheer number of workers is what we need going up against employers, right? When we're trying to make radical changes. So Stella, I wanna ask you, one, did you hear any of those kind of tensions happening in the emergency department? But two, I also want you to tell us, cause there's a lot of questions coming in from them, which is how, how did you pull off the strike in the emergency department. There were some clever uh, steps that you had to take to do it. Um, and I want, so if you can speak to any tensions about doing a whole hospital kind of approach together, and then how did you actually pull off the strike in the emergency department? Um, well, there are always tensions. Um, the management always tried to um, separate us or give, uh, wrongful information but we always managed to handle that i'd say perfectly fine because we would we would be standing together at all times we had um full-on solidarity with our cleaners or our service workers and everyone was standing next to each other we were doing this whole thing all together and that was a fact from the beginning. Everyone knew that from the beginning. And of course, it wasn't easy, but in the end, we won. So um, it was a really, really great experience to be standing with my whole team. And I'm not talking about the emergency room. I'm talking about every single person that is working in the hospital because we are all a team. Nothing works if one part of it just breaks away. I, I can't uh, treat a patient in in the OR when it's not been cleaned properly beforehand. So it's things like that. Um, actually, I do get the question quite often how we did pull off the strike in the emergency room. Um, it wasn't easy. It was really, really hard. And uh, I can't really tell you why, but I think it's because the structure and the working conditions in the emergency rooms have been really, really bad for a long time. And during the pandemic, it just went like an explosion, I guess. It was just way, way worse. And even a year before this whole thing started, we were like, actually, we should strike because this is not okay. The things that are happening to us and our patients are not okay. So it was bliss when organizing came into our clinics and uh, um, explained to us the whole process. And um, I was one of the first ones from the emergency departments to, I call it get organized because I was being organized by you guys. So um, 
it was it was an exciting journey, but um, I kind of lost track of what I was talking about. <laughs> you, know, you know what? I want I want to play back. No, no, that's all great. Frankly, listening to all of you is fascinating. But I want to zero in on there was a specific move that you had to make. It was technical and interesting, right? In the emergency department, about how many nurses were going to be left in the emergency department. Yes. Did, do you remember how did you arrive at that number? How did you twist the employer's bad actions towards you yeah. into a tactical move in the strike in the emergency department? So being short staffed in the emergency room isn't isn't like it, well, it's in everyday business. We are short staffed every single day, but there are days where we were even undercutting that amount of being short staffed. So we thought that our kind of like striking group, the member of people who would be in the emergency room during the strike, that we would cut them to the amount that the um, that the hospitals let us work in. So we basically said, you made us work with three people in the past. So our striking team would be three people. So yeah, and was, they couldn't was, even say any, yeah, they couldn't even say anything against it because they would make us work such shifts. And right. I would go as far as even telling, we would be even more responsible because our um, most short stuffed shift was two people in the emergency room, but we would say, we cannot, we cannot do that. It's just, it just, two people isn't enough. So we uh, put uh, one person more on top of that to be more responsible that our working place is. So, yeah, to be um, more responsible than your employer is, right? Yeah. But it's a, it's a fascinating concept. Again, so different than the US context, just for example, where in our case, you know, everyone has to walk out and then they hire replacement workers. And, and again, a lot of the leverage comes from how much we cost them, right, in the strike. So it's fascinating that you essentially figured out the, the, way, to, the way to get at them in the negotiation around how many workers would be able, able to strike, right? There's a sub-negotiation that goes on in Germany around negotiating the actual strike agreement. And in the emergency department, they thought, all right, we're gonna take the lowest number of people that you have made us work with, and we're gonna make a legal argument that that's, that's how many we're gonna leave in there, and the rest of us are going on strike. And it was like one of so many moments of brilliance, I thought, so kudos to you for that. I think I'm gonna to turn to David to ask a question that came in from the CDT. Uh, in Morocco. Um, it's a little bit aimed at Donna, but David, you're going to be more than capable of answering it um, and or anyone. And the question is that Donna mentioned many times the elections as a major uh, event, right? The, the September 26th, the federal elections. Um, and as a labor leader, uh, she insisted on the fact of leading their battle before the elections. I think there's some confusion about why that mattered and how, how, how that created leverage for you. Uh, so, David, do you want to try and take a stab at that? What was the, how did you understand the strategic relationship between big elections that were coming and the reason to use that as an ultimatum in the campaign? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, I tried to answer that. So, uh, basically, we were like um, having this whole campaign, it was like having two rails. And the one rail was to organize all our colleagues, all our co workers in the hospitals getting organized. And the second rail um, was telling the politicians um, or letting them know our demands, letting them know about our bad working conditions and telling them that they are specifically responsible for um, the bad health service that the people uh, in Berlin are getting in their hospitals and telling them precisely, specifically on and on and again and again that under these working conditions, it's not um, possible for us to treat our patients the way we would like to treat them and the way they deserve them and the way that we should treat them, treat them um, so that uh, they are recovering uh, the way they should. And you can also say, if you break it down, this whole strike that we were having last um, September, October, it was a strike for patient care. So um, like, we let the, the politicians know about our working conditions and said them, you have like, there are 100 days and you can like uh, fulfill our demands um, and give us the proper tools to fulfill our demands within these 100 days. And if you are not doing this, then we're off for a strike. And we are off for a strike like a couple of days 
before the elections, and this put a major, major pressure on the politicians. Yeah, and maybe just a quick follow up to that uh, wasn't part of the question, but I, when Donna was making her comment at the end, I think it, it, it may have been missed on people that part of the, that beautiful image of the church hearing that you did, that Donna mentioned was closed, the, the threat essentially was that the stories that you were telling, you were keeping private for the moment, but you had, tell us a little bit about what kind of politicians were in that room, but the threat, the implied threat was that you were gonna go public with all of the stories. And some of those stories involved patients dying, right? That's why it was a closed meeting initially, but maybe you could just say a couple more words about who, what politicians showed up in that church hearing and what was the feeling? Like, how did that play into the campaign? Got to unmute. So, um, yeah, like the, the feeling in this church, it was, it was super tense. So we had like uh, from the major parties in Berlin, all the people who were applying um, for the mayor positions in Berlin. So we had Franziska Giffey, who is now the mayor in Berlin, and she was at the meeting. And we put like huge pressure on all these politicians because we had uh, a lot of co-workers and colleagues um, uh, to write down one of the uh, one of the stories they have experienced in the in the last couple of weeks, months, last couple of years, where uh, there were um, situations where they couldn't guarantee the safety of the patients, and of course there were like uh, a, a level of uh, like drastic stories. There were like uh, extreme stories. You mentioned it already, Jane, like where patients were dying because uh, shifts were understaffed. Um, but there were also other, uh, other stories, like um, there were stories, uh, like one particular story I, I do remember where one colleague wrote down um, a, the story from a shift where they were uh, well staffed and she could care uh, perfectly for a patient to like um, illustrate the politicians. And when we have good working conditions, when we have a good nurse to patient ratios, we are capable of caring for our patients the way we should care for them. And uh, like we told the politician exactly what you said, um, like, if you're not fulfilling the demands, then we would go or like, like bring these stories to the public. We will hand them over to journalists and uh, like, uh, like the media in Berlin will tell or will let every uh, uh, man and woman living in Berlin know about the working conditions um, and the, the conditions for the patients in the hospitals in Berlin. Great. Um, now feel free, uh, any of you, uh, to respond to this question. Um, there are lots of questions coming in from different parts of the world. That's why I'm looking down and scrolling through them. Um, one question is coming in uh, from someone's name that I would completely mash, I'm pretty sure. But the question is, uh, what's, what was the reaction of the patients and their families? Like, what work did you do uh, to bring the public along um, in the campaign itself? And what was um, their reaction? And similarly, yeah, that's, I think that's a central question. Uh, let's just start with that one. Um, Stella, Adil, uh, maybe yeah. you want to go at it a little bit? Yeah. Is well, um, most of the patients and their relatives, they were really understanding. They were standing behind us because they knew um, what we were fighting for. Um, one thing that our employers did was um, people who would be normally coming in to have their operations that were elective, so a planned operation, they would make them come in knowingly that the operation would not take place and send them down to our strike posts, um, telling them it's their fault. Go down to them and ask them um, why you're not being operated on. So, and then they would send us those people who were curious. They were full of rage because the employer and the uh, doc some of the doctors would tell them complete lies. Um, then they would be at our strike post um, being absolutely curious and we would try to um, talk them down a little bit and then we would explain to them what was going on. That we were doing this to stop patient endangerment. That we don't want them to suffer from any complications after those surgeries because there is no nurse during the night who could uh, uplook every single one of those 40 patients. And then they would be like, oh, all right. They told me something completely different. 
I understand. I my operation can wait, and they would become from absolute enemies to total supporters. So that was actually um, they did strike themselves, I'd say. So they would not expect the people to react that way, and it was a really really good feeling for every single one of us. And um, things like that happened at every single strike post. So our employer and the doctors, they would send the patients down to every single strike post of all 12 hospitals. So we all had those conversations with those patients who in the end became supporters. So even, even better for us. That's amazing. So that's two instances back to back uh, coming from the emergency department from Stella Vivantes describing to us how an employer tactic was used against the employer right by smart worker yeah. leaders who said oh really okay we're going to have an organizing conversation with the patients and actually reverse it a deal i see you trying to get in there yeah i i would like to say that in our um, in our department it was also a big um, discussion that if we go to strike then how are people is going to get food or the cleaners or i don't know uh, all the gardeners and uh, there was a big big uh, thing things going around that if we will not be over here, if we go to strike, people will die with hunger and uh, uh, they will starve to death. And this was not a good thing. Uh, of course, um, we were also very worried about it, uh, that if for my own sake, if I leave all the patients, we are responsible. We are, this is our job. And we have to, uh, our job uh, uh, priorities come first. So we were like, should we go in a strike or should we just leave it like this? But uh, we were also um, very much confused. Um, but we forgot that there's always um, um, a way to do things which, uh, which, which was in lack in our, uh, in our uh, department, especially that before we go into the strike, it was all, uh, it has to go legally and with the structure and with that structure, if we follow it, then we can go on a strike and which we didn't knew it. So as a fact, I always um, uh, try to tell people that there's when you when there is an opportunity, there's also a structure that we have to follow it. All we need to do is educate ourselves. Of course, there was when we were on the strike, people were saying, yeah, um, what if my father don't get a food or stuff like this? And uh, He's a diabetic, maybe he gets a, a wrong food, which normally happens. Okay, normally happens, it's in a case. But when you are going through this strike and stuff like this, or demonstration, and you know you have left your job, you have left your duty, and you're just roaming around in the country or city and looking for more wages, doesn't make sense to people. It was very hard to, um, um, uh, how do you say this? Um, organize and um, educate people from our point of view that we are doing actually for them. I mean, it, it's for their own good future. Every this, all this uh, whole uh, community, this nurses and every worker, they are coming out to know the people, to know the truth, what is going around in hospitals, which I believe 90% of the people don't have any idea that uh, what it has done into, it's not about, um, about us getting more colleagues or more money. It's about bringing up this whole, and uh, I don't know, this soil, if uh, all the people who are learning, who's listening to us from all over the world, um, they will be very, um, uh, they will agree with me that this soil, uh, Germany has something, you know, um, it brings revolution, it doesn't, um, um, brings it down in bringing some new revolution every single in decades and in, in years you know um, whether we can take um, our walls or maybe bring down a wall or uh, uh, starting up with such a big uh, um, strikes in which has never been happened which we never thought of doing it so um, I believe yes there are there are the costing uh, consequence where you have to face people you have to face public, there's, there's no doubt. But um, as I said that we created in ourselves discipline. So with the discipline comes also, we, we make ourselves educated that how we can do it and take all the precautions. 
uh, we cannot just ignore anything like this and just go on for our demands. It has to go from step to step and um, together and um, legally, most of all, and without hurting anyone or bringing damage. And uh, I also believe, I would like to tell the people, uh, we, just, uh, we also should remember that all these strikes and demonstrations, what takes around, it happens only in a people, progressive people who looks for a good change. It doesn't happen uh, anyone who just, um, who keeps their eyes closed and then they think that um, a cat is not going to eat me like a pigeon. So it's in uh, the strikes and demonstration takes always place in a progressive people. So it means they need a change. And uh, that is why this strike was very, very important. Very, very important. I have taken you a lot of time, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's it's it's again, it's a total pleasure to listen to you and your role and the role of all of the workers um, in the hospital. And I think you just pointed it out really well. I mean, look, as I have said many times at the negotiating table myself, when the employer is trying to divide nurses or the certified professionals from the non nurses, last I looked in a hospital, if the cook puts salt to a diabetic or sugar or fill in the blank, they're capable of killing somebody, right? This is a hugely important role, just like a cleaner, because if someone gets an infection in an operating room, no matter what anyone else does, they're gonna face a great threat. I also wanna point out a deal as a segue to a question I'm gonna ask David, but all of you are welcome to answer it. Um, you said one of my very favorite words, a deal, which was discipline. Um, I love that word, methods and discipline, right? It takes a lot of that to pull off a 30,000 plus 11 hospital, 30 plus day strike uh, in a major city. So uh, discipline and method um, are something we believe in. And I wanna connect that to a question coming into us, which was before the pictures that we saw from the huge general assembly in the stadium and in the church, the question was, how did you talk to workers and where did you talk to them? Did you do this at work? Did you do it in the restaurant? Did you do it somewhere else? So uh, was there a particular way that you spoke to each other? What was the strategy and the discipline and the method about the conversations leading up to some of the beautiful images that we saw that happened later in the strike? Uh, and I think I'm gonna call on David to take a first crack at that. Yeah, so like we had, I, I don't remember how many one-on-one -on -one conversations I had in the last year, but uh, like we had tons of one-on-one -on -one conversations. And of course we talked to uh, like colleagues and coworkers in the hospital, but like it was like often and very often we made like appointments for a meeting, maybe after a shift, go grab some coffee and uh, like uh, tell the coworker, do you have 30 minutes? Do you have an hour? Like we have to talk about this in detail and like, the core um, for us was to understand that an organizing conversation is totally different from like um, chatting with someone. So it was like, um, we had um, like colleagues, of course, who weren't convinced of uh, the Berliner Krankenhaus Bewegung. And so uh, it was like very, um, what was very important was to letting the people know that we are having a purpose, that we are there. And it was like very important in these organizing uh, conversations that we were trying to move the colleague, to move the workers, and like one of the uh, like one of the key uh, key moments in the in this or like maybe two key moments in this organizing conversation is like um, uh, like at the beginning um, we are having this um, the, this conversation and then like we are asking our coworkers or our colleagues like what are the three things you would like to change about your working conditions and like we want like our coworkers and colleagues to be an active part of the movement. And so they are telling us uh, like the three uh, things they um, would like to change. And then we were getting back at the conversation like, like this is the opportunity. If you want to change these things, these three things, then the Berliner Krankenhaus Bewegung is the way to do it. And before we are like uh, wrapping the conversation up, there is um, like, like the the um, call the question is what we're calling it or um, uh, framing the choice so this is like the part where we are asking um, like our co-workers maybe in the first place we're asking them if they are ready to join the movement and then like we have to wait like we don't we, can, we can't answer this question for our colleagues and sometimes like we have to wait like for a minute or something like that because this is a question only our co-workers can ask 
And like when we're having like the second conversation, we're asking them if they're a non-union member, are you ready to join them to join the union? And then again, we have to wait. And like we have to wait until the people are ready and they have to, to answer these questions. And what is also like an important part of these organizing uh, conversation is um, like giving our colleagues and coworkers um, like the inoculation. Like what is happening if, or what do you think is happening when you're not joining the movement, when you're not joining the union? Do you really think like management will um, like um, will organize the, the better working conditions? Like they haven't done this for years. The only people who can do this the only one who can do it is you for yourself, like you and your colleagues. Yeah, and then like, of course, at the end of these organizing uh, conversation, it's always like, um, like the next steps, having a follow-up plan, maybe next meeting, uh, like, yeah, having a specific follow-up plan. This is like the like, like core to the organizing conversation. Yeah, I mean, David was almost basically doing a training on how to have a really effective one on one conversation right there that was pretty delightful um, to listen uh, to you lay that out. Um, and that goes back to discipline, that word that Adil used that I love, uh, and to method, right? We, we teach in the Organizing for Power course that there are strategies um, and methods and discipline uh, for each part of the work. David, you want to put something in there? Yeah, uh, sorry for interrupting you, Jane, but I, no, I, no. I, I would like to make like a, 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 sh a short uh, shout out because like a couple of us were like in the Organizing for Power um, sessions in 2019 and there is one, one phrase or one sentence, uh, Jolene Levitt, like an organizer with the UTLA in Los Angeles, was um, pointing out and it's, um, we the workers or you the workers are the architects of your workplace. Like, a shout out to Jolene Levitt, one of our terrific trainers from the United Teachers Los Angeles. I, I don't know if she's on the call, but like it would be great if she's on the call because she had this phrase uh, telling us like, arch, like the workers are the architects of the workplace. And this is a sentence or a phrase like I was repeating last year, I don't know, like for a hundred times, I think. And it's like, but it breaks it down to the core of the Berliner Krankenhaus Bewegung because this is what we were executing last year. We were, or we are, the architects of our workplace. And with these organizing tools we learned from 2019 to 2021, like we were able to pull it off. So a huge shout out to all the organizing for power uh, people, like organizers. Yeah, we're grateful for being a part of the movement. Well, uh, to talk about being part of the movement. We're grateful for you helping to lead the movement, brother uh, and sisters over there uh, right now in Germany. And they're ha they're, we're already hearing, by the way, I'm going to give a shout out to New Brunswick. Someone emailed me the other day and began to talk about the big strike that happened in Canada and New Brunswick recently. Apparently, a lot of them took an Organizing for Power course, may become a subject of a future show. We're not sure. I'm excited to follow it. But we are getting a lot of stories from a lot of people. Um, but the Berlin hospital movement has been extraordinary. So just given the time, because uh, we've got about 14 minutes left, I want to invite the three of you to make any kind of quick final comment. And then I'm going to bring back Donna. Uh, and we're going to move on to sort of how we're going to close out uh, with some very important uh, last sections of the program today. So, um, Stella, I'm going to start with you. Any any last comment? And I will say that there have been a lot of questions about overcoming fear. There's been a lot of questions about did you get solidarity from other organizations? I just want to throw a few of them out there in case you want to touch on them in your closing remarks. Um, a question came in about did union membership grow? I'm just going to answer it. It grew by thousands. So I'm just going to answer that one because I have the numbers. So yes, union membership grew in this strike and because of the struggle. But Stella, any closing comment that you wanna share with the rest of the world um, from your experience in this? Well, I'd say be really creative. Just uh, try to think of new things. Like we started a provocative campaign. So we were uh, to uh, kind of inform Berlin and the people who live there. So for example, we had a picture of a, of a midwife and the caption was, um, don't start pressing yet, your midwife isn't ready yet for it. So it was really, really provocative. And um, for instance, there was a colleague of mine from the emergency department and she would, um, her caption would be, I am resuscitating your mom. And in case something happens. So, and with the question for everyone being like, how important is good stopping in a hospital for you right now? 
like when you read this. So my apple would be basically just be really creative. Um, think with your colleagues, with your family, with your friends and start something completely new. And it worked out great for us. And we had 5,000 uh, Berliners in, at our demonstrations. So that was really, really great. So have fun as well. <laughs> have fun. Definitely having fun has to be part of our work because we know that when the employer is driving fear, one of the things that we have to do, uh, we call it cutting the tension, right? And cutting the tension really matters because Adil mentioned it earlier. I mean, there's a lot of tension in those moments. Uh, anyone who thinks that walking off the job is like simple um, hasn't actually really walked off the job in a very big strike because it's very, very hard and it's very scary. No matter how confident we are, uh, at least my very first one, it was one of the scariest moments of um, my life, I know. So, uh, David, uh, any closing quick comment from you before I go to a deal for the same? Like, I would uh, just come back to the overcoming fear. Uh, I think, like, at the beginning of the campaign, as I told uh, at the beginning uh, of the panel, uh, I was not 100% convinced that we would win this campaign. And there were like days where uh, I was not 100% convinced that we were winning this campaign, but there were a lot of days, a lot of days where um, some of my co coworkers joined the union. I would never thought that they would join the union. Like when we pulled off like marches, demonstrations, um, or having like strategic Zoom meetings, where I was like, okay, these are like uh, the people I want to go through with this. I want to um, bring this to a victory and I want to win with these people. And this was like one of the best experience in my whole lifetime. And I can only like shout out to everyone out there, like um, keep up the struggle. If you're working in a hospital, strike for patient care. Yeah. And get things going. Fantastic. I'm going to close it out with a deal. Any final comments for the audience? Something you want to share? I will just like to tell my all the colleagues around the world that we should not forget that when you are working in some any any field or something and you are being opposed a boss or a company on you just remember your boss is there to earn money from you or earn something better more and more from you so you are a product so you have to know your value first, that you are a product because money will devalue from time to time. It, will, it has been from, from ages, but you are a product. You have to know yourself, um, polish yourself, um, educate yourself. And um, believe me, uh, there, there are still some uh, humanity left and we really need this quite kind of um, voices or uh, people who just make us aware, like me, I'm still young, and I have to think about my future just like you guys or any uh, all the all the respected people sitting over here. We thought about our future. We thought about upcoming days, what we are going to do because we are being demolished. It's coming uh, to all under one roof. We will just live and work and work and work there will be no benefits so it's never too late to start again and um, keep unity and i always say um, i mean i would love to say again um, bring yourself a discipline and educate yourself and move forward with the with your union come together educate people tell them your colleagues uh, even if they don't understand, some people are strong, some people are weak, some people have so many other problems, family problems in the uh, pandemic like COVID, we are, everyone is afraid of losing a job. There's a pressure from all over the places and if someone cannot do it, don't just let him alone. Go to him, talk to him and um, understand his situation, not just because I'm young, I'm single, I can just go out around and I can even live for 50 euros over here. But they're like people who are earning and running the whole family. So take the weak one, start from the weak people who are smaller, who are not known. Um, count every single person in your, um, in your uh, working department, no matter what he does, bring yourself, make a community, make a unity and with the discipline move forward and i wish you every single person over here 
all the best for every what what are you thinking about your plannings and everything and i would also like uh, to thank in the end um jenny for making so easy etienne stella uh, a great lady i mean you had full, you have made everything so change i mean uh, we need more women like you david and every single person and all my uh, um my union workers every single one you are like a god to me <laughs> i fantastic. adore you fantastic respect you fantastic thank great you so much great to have you great to hear from you uh global shout out i'm not even looking in the chat because there's a million people already thanking all of you for what you've taught them what i want to do now after so graciously appreciating all of the contributions from stella and david and adil um i'm going to ask uh, donna lutzenberg to come back up and i believe also katerina vesenik and we're going to do a little handoff uh and I'm going to let Donna and Katerina and the folks who are in Nordrhein-Westfalen uh, to come on stage and talk about some questions came in about where does this movement go next. Conveniently, we have an answer to that question. So, Donna and Katerina. Aha! Tell us what that is, Donna. Unmute yourself. And, and everyone remember, this is going to be in German, I believe. So have your English globe on. Uh, Donna, English or German, uh, mm -hmm. speaking to where this is going to go uh, next. Uh, there we go. There's there's a bunch of healthcare workers. Here we go. Donna, take it away. Also, das ist unser this right here is our button. We made this in 2016 when we first handed it over to our colleagues in the Saarland. But last year it came back to us. We got it back from the UKSH, the University Clinics of Schleswig-Holstein in the north of Germany. And now I want to hand it back over to NRW, Nordrhein-Westfalen, because healthcare workers there are now starting their movement for an agreement on better staffing rules in hospitals. My name is Katarina. There you go. Say it again. Say it again. Now we can hear Hi, you. Hi, Jane. I am I am Katarina Wesenik, and I'm here in Aachen. It's <laughs> one of the early activists of the University um, Hospital of Aachen. So I want to talk about. Fantastic, fantastic. So these people are shouting, we want to have a staffing contract for us in North Rhine Westphalia. What is it, is it, is it about? I'm trying to, uh, to break it very short. Um, we are here on behalf of thousands of Verdi members, um, distributed over six big uh, university hospitals here in North Rhine Westphalia. North Rhine Westphalia uh, represents kind of a quarter uh, of all Germans. Uh, so it's a, it's a very important big state and we have elections coming up this May. So what we did is like we kind of did um, adapt to this, those wonderful strategies um, uh, of the Berlin colleagues. And we are, uh, we, we are calling the, 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 the state government to implement, to negotiate a staffing contract um, regarding all, um, uh, all professions. So um, we are standing uh, united here. Uh, and we want to have the um, staffing nurse ratio patient uh, contract for everybody working in, in the six university hospitals across Northern Westphalia. And we want to have it now. And uh, um, we gave um, uh, kind of, a, we, we, we made an ultimatum like uh, you guys in Berlin did so su successfully. Uh, and if this federal, now the state government is, uh, has not been um, sign this contract with us, we are willing to go on strike, which would mean that more than 60,000 people theoretically would um, protest and go on the street. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, enough is enough. We're going to take uh, back what, what we need. So thank you so much for the baton. Um, and uh, we will do everything possible in our hands 
to, uh, to deserve it. And we will pass it along, hopefully across uh, the whole world, across everybody um, in, this, in this wonderful um, yeah, winning show to, tonight. And we keep you posted. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, yeah, so so we went from from just over 30,000 workers going on strike in Berlin to now we're facing somewhere between 50 and 60,000 workers going on strike in a different state, in a very big and very politically and industrially important state in Germany. So no pressure, no pressure, but we can't wait to watch your campaign too, and we can't wait to watch you win. Great to have you all. Ethan, I'm turning it over to you. We're about out of time now, uh, so I'm gonna keep things really, really short. Uh, what I'll say is a uh, very quickly, thanks to all of these folks who are on there today, to Jane, to Stella, Adil, David, Adana, you know, uh, the folks from North Rhine-Westphalia for your struggle and also for taking your time to be here with us today. Uh, to our interpreters, to all of our team, Safrir, Sarah, happy birthday, Sarah, to Vipka, Florian, Fanny, and all the folks uh, at the RLS Mothership in Berlin. Uh, to those of you who are watching, to the more than 1,400 of you who were here watching, we've had a lot of questions about the transcript, about a possible recording. Uh, and let me say that we don't usually release these uh, because in uh, this increasingly isolated age that we live in, uh, we want to privilege live and in-person experiences. Coming together with the more than 1,400 of you today is a part of that experience. That said, we hear you, uh, and we will try to figure out if we can make a one-time exception and produce a follow-up video that helps you to fully digest all of the rich stuff that we've talked about today. And we do hope that you have come away with some important lessons about how to prepare and win a serious campaign. And we hope that you have come away inspired and ready to talk with folks in your workplace, in your union, in your community about what winning looks like. And for those of you who uh, are inspired and who do think that today's lessons could help your campaign and help you as an organizer, we encourage you to register for Organizing for Power's core fundamentals, which kicks off this May 10th and runs for six consecutive Tuesdays until June 14th. The train is, training is completely free, but it is designed exclusively for groups of 10 plus people. We've got that registration link for our groups and it should be filled out by a group contact person who must include the contact information of all group members joining them in the training. This 10 person minimum is based on our experience running these trainings. And it's because fundamentally we believe that there is a world to win, but the, we are only going to win it if we're in this together. So if you don't currently have a group of 10, well, you've got more than three months to find one until our May 3rd registration deadline. And if you're like our comrades in Morocco and you already have a big old group that's ready, use this time to, 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 to prepare and to build on your campaign and figure out ways to build it in to the uh, training that we'll be having. We've had groups of 25, 50 plus, 100 plus, several hundred people, unions that have signed up hundreds upon hundreds of their members and fully integrated this training into detailed campaign and strike preparation. Just look at our German hospital workers today to imagine where that can take you. And no matter how large or small your group, know that like with anything in life, the more you put into it, the more you'll get out of it. Start building your organizing group to take part in our training and get ready to take the next step in joining our global community of people who are organizing to win. Uh, on that note, I'm going to open the chat back up. We're going to say say goodbye. It's for you all to uh, to give your appreciation for our hospital workers, for North Rhine Westphalia, for the battles to come. It was a pleasure and a privilege to spend the last hour and a half with all of you together, staring victory in the face. This is what winning looks like. And until next time, solidaritet, fuerza, a forza, ecchuta, muta daminun, crepites, bon courage, and strength and solidarity in your struggles to come.